Mark Rogers, TV, the voice of college football, striking up the live stream at about uh, 925 Eastern time on a Wednesday. Let's see, Thursday night. Boy, Mike, I tell you, I lose uh, track of the uh, time, but uh, considering Friday and Saturday's the weekend, I shouldn't uh, do that. Uh, we got Mike Laval from Last Word on College Football on the line as uh, he and the rest of the crew, Tony Syracusa, Kevin McGuffey are uh, getting us all set for college football 2018, just about 80 days away. Mike, how you doing tonight? I was just about to say, Mark, I don't know what day it is. Don't know what uh, month it is. All I know is uh, uh, 74 days, I think 74 days until college football kicks off, depending on when you count the first game, whether you count week zero or week one. I'm doing fantastic, Mark. Thanks for having me in. Always a pleasure to join. Yeah, I enjoy these various countdowns that you'll see on social media that will point out a record or typically a jersey number that uh, signifies the number of days left until college football. And then you can uh, pick out your favorite 82 or 61 or whatever it is as we uh, count down the days. Probably something we should add to Mark Rogers TV, but uh, there just doesn't seem to be enough time. Well, Brandon Kennedy certainly had enough time to weigh his options and um, consider the Tennessee Volunteers and Jeremy Pruitt's uh, program start there in Knoxville uh, coming over from Alabama. Yeah, big news today. Uh, 247 is reporting that Alabama transfer Brandon Kennedy has chosen uh, the Vols. Uh, he'll be enrolling in the second half of summer in early July in a couple of weeks. Of course, uh, he was the center of, of kind of as much discussion a few weeks ago as Nick Saban was blocking uh, his discussions with both Auburn and Tennessee, the two schools he was choosing because of the SEC's rule uh, that, that allowed coaches and programs to block uh, graduate transfers from dis from talking to other schools in, in the conference. Of course, in the NCAA, graduate transfers can transfer to any other school, but in the SEC, uh, they had a more strict policy uh, that allowed coaches to block inside the conference, uh, you know, for whatever reasons. Uh, the NC or the SEC obviously concerns about uh, the interconference and having to play the team that you came from. But the NC, uh, the SEC got rid of that rule, uh, probably in concert with the two new rules from the NCAA. So Brandon Kennedy was able to talk to both Auburn and Tennessee. And 247 is reporting that he's made up his mind to join Jeremy Pruitt and his staff there at Tennessee. Interestingly enough, he's the third big time transfer that will be in Knoxville starting this summer. Uh, of course, he'll join Keller Christ, uh, quarterback from Stanford and Madre London, uh, running back from Michigan State as three uh, impact transfers. Uh, you know that Brandon Kennedy is probably almost, uh, you know, almost assuredly will, will start at, at center for the for the Tennessee Volunteers. Madre London will obviously get plenty of playing time. He's going to be a uh, force uh, inside the tackle on the inside running game. And then, of course, Keller Christ. Uh, will come in there and he'll compete with Jarek Guarantano for the starting quarterback position for Tennessee. So, so Jeremy Pruitt, uh, you know, didn't have a lot of time to put together a, a top five or top ten recruiting class for 2018, but he's hit the transfer market hard and he's brought in three guys who are really going to contribute uh, to Tennessee in 2018 uh, in the transfer market. And of course, Brandon Kennedy making that announcement today uh, for the third impact transfer. So reviewing Brandon Kennedy's uh, credentials coming out of high school, he was the third rated offensive lineman or specifically offensive center so the third rated center coming out of high school football according to rivals 13th rated player in the state of alabama recruited actually to alabama by kirby smart interesting to see that and obviously that was a few years ago going back to the class of 2015 as he committed to the tide the previous summer he will play for the tennessee volunteers and jeremy pruitt as uh, pruitt tr tries to uh resurrect uh, Tennessee's program. We got Mike Laval on the line from Last Word on College Football to discuss Tennessee, the SEC, and the nation. Mike, uh, usually putting some interesting topics uh, uh, to pen and paper uh, as he um, likes to hit some of the broad and bigger topics and interesting angles uh, to the game of college football and some of those questions that um, uh, cause us to think and debate and discuss. And one of those recently would be uh, unbreakable records in college football, Mike. So uh, I'll let you take it from here and I'll try to poke some holes in many of your arguments. Yeah, so you were talking about the, uh, the the days to go countdown on social media. We we have ours at Last Word on CFB, our Twitter site at Last Word on CFB. Today was uh, uh, the the record seventy seven days to go, and David Pilon from Houston holds the FBS record with seventy seven pass attempts in one game without throwing an interception. Now I don't know 
uh, that that's an unbreakable record in today's past happy offenses. But what I do think is an unbreakable record is total offense yards per game in a season. Do you know who owns that, uh, Mark? So I know that the Oklahoma team that lost to Florida in the national championship game in 2008 and only scored 14 points in that game, uh, in regards to power five performance offensively with Sam Bradford at the controls ranks very high scoring like 60 points in six consecutive games. So they come to mind. I would think that in, some indiv- of those Houston in, teams individual record Lingler or Andre Ware at quarterback would, would be some of the teams that would trump those numbers. Yeah, so you nailed it. I, I looked at Power Five only, or uh, yeah, Power Five only, and uh, looked at individual records only. David Klingler yards per game average for a season: four hundred and seventy-four point six yards per game per uh, per game for a whole season. Now, of course, he was aided with a seven hundred yard game, but in today's college football, uh, with the athleticism uh, on both sides, there I, I think there's parity in college football today more so than in the past. You look at UCF going thirteen zero, Boise State being good for a decade and a half, TCU being good for a decade and a half, uh, you know, some of these schools that haven't necessarily been good, uh, you know, th- th- there isn't a, a real true cakewalk anymore. Uh, I-, I think there's parity. Uh, so you get a guy that uh, is going to, that's going to put up 300, 350, 400 yards per game. Y- you're winning. You're going to win. Uh, you're going to win a majority of those games, hopefully uh, by a substantial margin. You want to get that guy out. Quarterbacks are so important in the game today. Uh, that, that you're not going to let a guy stay in a game for 500 yards every game. It's interesting. In the last 10 years, only five other players have even had over 400 yards of total offense average for the uh, for the season. Lamar Jackson, 404. Patrick Mahomes was the closest to getting uh, was the closest to Klingler's record at 444 in 2016. Uh, Connor Holiday had 415. Derek Carr had 400 on the dot. And then, interestingly enough, Case Keenum had three seasons where he averaged 400 yards. Uh, per uh, average 400 yards per game, uh, 404, 413, and 402 in three of his four seasons, four full seasons uh, there at Houston. So, you know, I, I think with with guys who uh, have that star potential, you're going to keep them in there. You're going to kind of preserve them for the conference championship games, for the bowl games, because you're trying to get to the high level. So I, I think coaches are less apt to leave guys in uh, and just you know, to get 500 yards a game, you have to stay in pretty much every game till the end. I think coaches are much less apt to do that. Pull these guys early, let the backup guy get some uh, get some meaningful reps in because you know with, in college football as when the pros, uh, you know your backup quarter, you're only as good, you're only as good of a program as your backup quarterback is good. So get, I think coaches are much more quick to get the backup in and get him uh, meaningful reps in. So you know I think one of the unbreakable college football records I don't think that we'll see broken anytime soon is is David Klingler's 474 yards per game average for an entire season. Mike, there are so many oddities connected to that uh, Houston football program around that time for a number of reasons uh, kind of converging at the same time. So we're talking late 80s, early 90s with Andre Ware and David Klingler, specifically those two guys at quarterback, which produced a Heisman Trophy for Ware in 1989. I'm looking at the 1990 Houston Cougars and it's bringing scores and situations to mind. So number one would be that Houston played in the Southwest Conference, which was a football juggernaut throughout the 60s and before that through the 70s into the 80s. And then they had some defections. They had some programs that that slumped SMU in particular, which had been a near dynasty and, and played really well, of course, uh, at the culmination of that with uh, Eric Dickerson and Craig James at running back. But they had a number of, of really good programs that fell on hard times. So the the quality of the Southwest Conference went downhill pretty quickly. So Houston was facing a lot of marginal competition. Their non-conference schedule wasn't that good. So they would just go out and bludgeon teams. And obviously they they had a coaching style, uh, whether it was John Jenkins or others who wouldn't take the foot off the pedal, as Mike uh, just described to us. So it was the style of offense. It was the mentality that you didn't do the gentleman's uh, approach of uh, letting your foot off the pedal late in the game. It was the poor schedule, the poor schedule out of conference in particular. And then they had some odd seasons in which they would they would play somebody really good at some point in the season. I remember a specific game that Klingler and Houston played against Miami when they were racking kind of points like nobody's business then they ran into a brick wall uh, against the Miami Hurricanes and some of that great talent that uh, we know very well the other issue in this and angle was that they were constantly 
having issues with the NCAA on probation. They didn't play in a lot of bowl games. So this particular season, there was no bowl game. Uh, well, actually, in this season, I'm yeah, there, there was no bowl game. No bowl game. They played Arizona State out of conference to conclude the season, but uh, they didn't play in a bowl game that year. So they finished at 10 and 1 after they dusted off the Sun Devils 62 45. Their one loss was against a ranked number 24 Texas team 45 24. So it was just an odd time for the Houston Cougars and, and just some oddities if you're into numbers, statistics, and scores. Interestingly enough, you mentioned Andre Ware. Andre Ware won the Heisman Trophy the year before. David Klingler did not win the Heisman Trophy that year. Uh, that went to Ty Detmer at BYU. And, you know, I, I gotta, I gotta think if a guy produces four hundred seventy-four point six yards per game, uh, you know, I, I gotta think that the reason why he didn't win the Heisman Trophy is because of the troubles that Houston had had as a program, and because Andre Ware uh, had won the previous year and because voters saw him as a system quarterback. All three of those things, I think, converged, and that's what allowed Ty Detmer to, to win the Heisman that year instead of the guy who produced 475 yards per game. That number is just astonishing. Yeah, I was trying to look up the game log, but the uh, collegefootballreference.com didn't go back that far with a game-by-game, so I would have had to click on each and every box score. He, I'm he, had, he, he had one game with over 700 yards passing offense. I think he had a game with 11 touchdowns. I believe that's also an NCAA record that year, uh, 11 passing touchdowns in one game. Yeah, and the Andre Ware um, ledger the previous season includes a 95-21 to 21 win over SMU. <laughs> yeah, I, I think uh, I think uh, Houston had a seventy-seven nothing win that year as well. So two 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 seasons in a row, they put up one hundred and sixty, one hundred seventy-two in two games. Yeah, they also beat Rice sixty-four to nothing. They beat Baylor sixty-six ten and Temple sixty-five seven. Now they did run into a couple defenses in Texas A and M and Arkansas, who held them to a seventeen thirteen loss and forty-five thirty-nine. A game there against Arkansas and losing the two games that they did the previous season, the Andre Ware season, uh, before Klingler went ten and one. All right, what next, else do we have, Mike? Next unbreakable record for you. This is kind of a lead, and you should get this one. I've kind of given you a hint. Most career passing yards in in FBS football. So, hmm, we're talking Houston quarterbacks, but for some reason, I. I thought that belonged to one of the Hawaii guys, either Cold Brennan or Timmy Chang. T Timmy I Chang is number two, 4,000 yards short of the number one guy. The distance between number two and number 16 is I guess distance. it is Case Keenum. It is Case Keenum. He had, he had four seasons, over 400 yards per game, 20,113 total yards in his five-year career. Really, Timmy Chang was uh, 3,204 yards short of that which is the same distance between him and 15th place on the overall list. Uh, Case Kim got hurt, I believe, his junior year. Uh, so, so he got a fifth uh, injury, uh, injury justified fifth year, uh, which was his 2011 season where he had 404 yards per game. So 20,113 yards. Again, I think the reason why that record's never going to be broken, because if you have a guy who's played for four years, uh, suffered to uh, at least one injury and has 16,000 yards, he's probably going to go in the NFL draft. You just don't see guys who put up, uh, who have that talent, that arm strength, uh, and and, uh, and and who put up those numbers stay in college football much longer these days. Uh, you know, I, I think Case Keenum, uh, you know, if Case Keenum played a decade later in today's game, of course, he's only out of college for about seven years. I think if he had played a little bit later, uh, you know, he, he would have probably came out early uh, and, and Timmy Chang might <laughs> might have that record. But again, the second place guy is 3,204 yards short. Uh, and then you talk about system. There are a lot of pass happy offenses today, but a lot of college football is the RPO. You got to have a quarterback that's mobile. A, lo a lot of coaches think that you got to have that mobile quality to a quarterback. He's got to be able to run at least a little bit. Uh, Houston quarterbacks did not run very much. They pretty much passed every play. So I think another one of the unbreakable college football records comes from Houston Case Keenum, 20,113 yards over five seasons. So 
Uh, let's make a distinction between records that will probably never be broken. And this is, I think you're staying in the spirit of this because there are other records that aren't going to be broken because of the style of play and the game's just not the same game as the, the, the game that's not coming to memory in regards to the, the, the two schools, I believe Cumberland was involved yeah, in Georgia the 222 to nothing game. That was Georgia Tech and Cumberland, 212, 212 to zero. Of course, Cumberland is, is right it was next 222 to 222. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, 222. You're right. 222 to zero, uh, Cumberland University. They're from Lebanon, Tennessee, close to where I grew up, and Georgia Tech, the Rambling Wreck. So you're staying in the spirit of this is still the game, the same game we're competing uh, against right now and watching. Certainly, I, I kind of kept it to the modern era. Of course, the you know you, know, you go back to the 1937 Tennessee Volunteers, un, un, uh, undefeated, untied, and unscored upon. Didn't give up a point in the entire regular season. So I, I didn't go all the way back to the 30s and the 40s. Uh, I kept it kind of modern era, and I kept it FBS, uh, just for kind of relevancy of the record's sake. Do we have any others? Are, are uh, yes, those- we do. And, uh, another note on Case Keenum, again, another Houston quarterback that never won the Heisman Trophy, even though he threw for 20,000 yards. Uh, you know, I think, uh, again, I think they probably saw him as a system running back. All right, Mark, here's another one. I don't think it's ever going to be broken. Most rushing attempts in one game. What would you say? All right. Um, give me one hint and I'm going to ask for the hint to be a distinction between power five and group of five, uh, power five. I was kind of looking for the number power five and it's, uh, more than half a hundred. Oh, shoot. I, 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 I'm almost for sure going to know it once I hear it, but I'm not coming up with it. Did uh, LaDainian Tomlinson carry the ball that much? I know he had a, no. like a 400 yard game. No. Uh, yeah, give it to me. A guy named Tony Sands from Kansas in 1991 against Missouri had 58 rushing attempts in one game. I remember the name. If a, if a coach ran a guy, one guy, 58 times today, <laughs> it, he would get taken to task uh, by both the media, the player's parents, probably the player uh, and the administration. You just can't, I mean, you just can't run a guy 58. Most th- There are some teams that don't run 58 plays in a game. Uh, I don't know of any team that has 58 rushes in a game anymore. Uh, and on top of that, one guy having 58 carries in one game. Uh, in that game, uh, that was against Missouri in 1991. Kansas won the game 53 uh, 29. That Missouri team that year gave up over 36 points per game. They were a, a horrible defensive team uh, that year. On the day, he gained 396 yards. But here's what here's what's interesting. Uh, I believe the most it, he, his average. If you would have used that game. Uh, he would have broken the all-time career rushing attempt if you use the average for that game uh, in just over two seasons. Uh, I believe the career rushing record is like uh, 1,200 and uh, something. Uh, if you use that that average of his, he would have broken it in, in barely over two seasons. So that's an asterisk from a percentage perspective of the all-time uh, rushing carry. Uh, that that one game, 58 carries, is, is an astronomically high percentage. But can you imagine a coach running a guy 58 times uh, in a game today? Even in 1991, we're not talking about 1945. 1991 wasn't that long ago, or maybe I'm just getting old. I know it was uh, 27 years ago, but uh, you know it's modern football. 58 rushes in one game, and not to backtrack, but I'm looking up Case Keenum because I'm I'm curious as to his Heisman finishes uh, during these just phenomenal uh, statistical seasons. So he did finish seventh and eighth in the Heisman balloting. Uh, His final two full seasons in which he threw 44 touchdowns and 48 touchdowns with over 5,600 yards both seasons. Both both of those seasons averaged over 400 yards per game, too. That's crazy. All right. Anything else? I I could play this all night. This is Uh, great. uh, one, One more for you. You probably know this one. Most rushing attempts without losing a fumble. In college. Yes. Uh, let, let's go back to Sands real quick. The uh, record for most rushing attempts in a career is 1,220. That's Ron Dane for Wisconsin. Oh, ha. I wish he would have let me guess that. I think uh-huh. I would have nailed that one. Most rushing attempts without losing a fumble. Uh, see, I was thinking about Dane when you asked that, but that's not my answer necessarily. Most rushing attempts without a fumble. Guy was famous for never fumbling. 
he he fumbled once in the fourth game of his career and fumbled twice in the last game of his career. Fourth game of his freshman year and last game of his senior year. Three fumbles his entire career. Okay, that 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 sparks something there. There's there's something there as soon as you mentioned twice in his final game. What what era were you, we're talking pretty recent uh, very, uh pretty recent his final game i believe was a bowl it was definitely a bowl game i believe the opponent was florida huh. this is, uh ended his career in 2008 2008 against florida well oh and, and i do not believe he ever won a game against the buckeyes okay okay you, you that helps a whole lot uh but you didn't need to go there because yeah Tebow won the Heisman in 07 and actually lost a bowl game. And it was actually record wise, the worst record of his career. Uh, but they played Michigan in a really good capital one bowl. And Mike Hart was on the other side. There you go. 1,005 carries without fumbling fumbled in the fourth game of his freshman year. And then fumbled twice in that bowl game against Florida. His last college game did not fumble for three and a half years in between. Yes. Uh, over a thousand carries. The the record, like I said, the record for most carries in a career is twelve twenty. So so he was uh, he was at about eighty three percent of the record for most carries in a career without fumbling, just uh, or without losing a fumble. Just an incredible, incredible record. So think about the Ron Dane career, much like what you um are talking about with Tony Sands and project that out to an entire career of carrying the ball over three hundred times per season over the course of an entire col college career and then going into the NFL and that NFL team being confident that you're going to be um, <laughs> hitting the hole for, for more than three or four seasons. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 part of the reason why that's never going to be broken is just simply luck. I mean, it, there's, there's an incredible amount of luck that over a thousand carries, you don't get hit in the wrong spot that, you know, a helmet doesn't hit your hand. Uh, you, you don't hit your own lineman and have a butt fumble. Uh, even when you do fumble the ball, it's recovered by your own team. It's just an astonishing amount of luck uh, to go over a thousand carries in your career, three and a half full seasons without losing a fumble. Just incredible. Uh, I don't think you can have uh, that luck. Uh, any anymore? I, I I think that's probably the most unbreakable record in my in my uh, in my estimation. So we've got Mike Laval on the line uh, from Last Word on College Football. Always enjoy the discussion with Mike. Uh, check out the article "Unbreakable Records in College Football." I'm sure Mike would would appreciate a follow on Twitter at. Uh, Oh my goodness! You're gonna have to spit out uh, your handle, Mike, because it's uh, just a Mike, bunch of letters right now. You can find me at Mike L underscore LWS. Uh, you can find us at Last Word on College Football dot com. The uh, Unbreakable Records article will be out next week. It's it's currently sitting there waiting, and you can follow us at Last Word on College Football on Twitter. You can see our countdown until opening day for the 2018 college football season. So yeah, this is fun for college football fans who are star for college football discussion and waiting for the season. So check out Mike on his Twitter handle. Also last word on college football because, and, and serve up your comments and your questions and obviously suggestions uh, in regards to content and also uh, an unbreakable record or two that you think uh, should be on the list. Mike, uh, it's always a pleasure, sir. Uh, we appreciate it. Mark, always a pleasure to join Mark Rogers TV.